Good morning, everybody. Welcome to UC Berkeley. I'm Claire Holmes, Associate Vice Chancellor of Communications and Public Affairs. And we are very, very happy to be here today. I was so happy, in fact, that I got a speeding ticket at 6 AM, <laughs> hurrying to get down here. Um, we are very pleased to announce the Nobel Prize winner in economics. And I just would like to say that this is a shining example of the reason why it's so important to support UC. Um, so we're going to start today with some introductions of some of our professors and um, distinguished faculty. So with that, I'd like to introduce Carla Hesse, who is the Dean of Social Sciences in our College of Letters and Science here at Berkeley and a professor of history. She's a prize-winning scholar whose interests center on modern Europe. She's had 20 years experience teaching at Berkeley, and among her awards and honors, she's won the prestigious Abby Warburg Prize, which is given to uh, social science scholars and humanities. So welcome, Carla. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And I can't say what a great pleasure it is as Professor Williamson's newest dean. In fact, we've never had the pleasure to meet because I'm such a new dean. Uh, this is my second month on the job, but what could be more wonderful uh, way to begin the job as Dean of Social Sciences, uh, but with a Nobel Prize in the Social Sciences. This is the fifth Nobel Prize in economics for this campus. We're moving in there on uh, physics and uh, other distinguished areas of tradition on campus, and we're delighted to uh, join in their ranks. And as you'll see, there are numerous deans who want to say something here today. And I, I just want to say that that's a testimony to how collaborative the work that Professor Williamson has done here at Berkeley has been, uh, spanning both um, the economics, the field of economics and social sciences, law, and uh, of course, um, distinguished work at the Haas Business School. So I will turn this over so that others who have uh, much closer relations with Professor Williams can uh, speak. But uh, go Bears, and thank you so much for contributing to our wonderful campus with your wonderful and distinguished work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Christopher Edley, who is the chair and dean of the UC, UC Berkeley School of Law and a distinguished um, and honorable William H. Oreck distinguished faculty member. He's a veteran of two tours of the White House, service in twice that many presidential campaigns, though he still looks quite young. Um, he's played a central role in national politics for more than three decades. It's my pleasure to bring up Christopher Edley. Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, I was quite surprised uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning to learn that my former student had won the Nobel Peace Prize. But this morning, I was not surprised at all to learn that Ollie Williamson had uh, won this long overdue uh, recognition from the Nobel Committee. Uh, I'm here to uh, demonstrate in the flesh uh, the extraordinary breadth of Ollie's contributions. Uh, for years, he was an anchor in the jurisprudence and social policy program uh, at the law school, uh, a multidisciplinary program. Uh, the work that you're going to hear about in a few minutes uh, has deeply informed uh, the work of the law at regulating behavior, of dealing with issues of authority and agency. Uh, it really is one of the most glorious things about this campus. Uh, that scholars of Professor Williamson's distinction uh, don't live in intellectual silos, uh, but instead share their gifts widely and deeply uh, with so many units on campus, so many students. Uh, and uh, Ali really is an exemplar of, uh, of that phenomenon. Uh, and we at the law school could not be more pleased, could not be more pleased uh, to lay claim to at least a part of him and to bask in his reflected glory. Congratulations, Ali. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to also introduce uh, two other of our most distinguished faculty here. Um, Richard Lyons, who's the dean of the Haas School of Business, who uh, took over the deanship in July of 2008 after serving as the chief learning officer at Goldman Sachs in New York for two years. Um, prior to that, he was a finance professor here at the Haas School starting in 1993. And uh, joining Richard is Gerard Roland, who is the chairman of economics at UC Berkeley. He joined the faculty in 2001. And among Professor Roland's awards and honors are the recipient of the Medal of the University of Helsinki, um, Officer de l'Ordre de Leopold II. And he will fix that when he gets up here. Um, he was also the program chair of the fifth Nobel Symposium in Economics devoted to the economic transition in 1999 to socialism and capitalism. So because of um, Ali's appointments across the campus, both of them will introduce him and bring him up for you guys to talk to as well. Thank you, Claire. I'll offer a, a few thoughts, and then I know Gerard will have a few, and then I might have a couple more. But we will, we will get to the, to the guest of honor, I promise. Berkeley is a multidisciplinary place. Uh, it always has been. The kind of connective tissue between the disciplines and between the departments is, is really part of the DNA of this place. And the professional schools here, the law school, the business school, and other professional schools, are schools where those disciplines come together very, very naturally, very, very fruitfully. Uh, in a business school, we have sociologists, we have psychologists, we have political scientists, we have economists, right? Oliver Williamson's work is not only profound, but it spans so much intellectual space, so rigorously, so effectively. Quick thought from the business school, right? When we start thinking about firms and how managers do their work, there are a lot of people on our faculty that think about the formal organization of the firm and why it looks the way it does. And a lot of our faculty that focus on the informal organization of the firm, the culture, the norms and values, the social norms that produce behaviors. Ollie was spanning both of those spaces very, very early on. And you'll hear more about the core of his thoughts. I'll turn it over to Gerard. So I'm really thrilled to, to be here and uh, uh, as chair of the economics department. I, I have to start with a, a memory when I was a graduate student uh, uh, reading the 1975 book uh, by Oli Markets and Hierarchies had, had a deeply uh, 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 inspiring effect on me. This is you know, one, one of the uh, uh, works that sometimes you read and that really inspires you. I must say that uh, 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 Professor Williamson uh, not only made major advances in terms of understanding what is called the boundaries of the firm, which activities take place on the market, which take place inside the firm, which was uh, mentioned today, uh, uh, but uh, more uh, broadly, he is uh, one of the founding fathers of what is called the, the new institutional economics, and uh, uh, in, nobody else than him has really uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 made such effort and had such an influence in putting uh, uh, the uh, idea of institutional economics uh, uh, to the forefront. The idea that that institutions, the rules of the game in a society, are actually uh, uh, you know what we have to understand and which are the the uh, uh, underlying uh, 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 element uh, that uh, that we need to to study in order to to uh, analyze economic performance. Uh, so uh, contrary to a tradition that was you know, quite long in economics of taking the market as a, a unit of analysis, uh, he has uh, uh, in taken the transaction, that is a transaction between uh, uh, business partners, between, between agents as the, the basis of the analysis. And this uh, helped him uh, uh, um, um, build a, a grandiose theory that has uh, had such a profound influence not only on those who study uh, the theory of the firm, uh, uh, those who study industrial organization, the theory of contracts, uh, uh, but uh, he, he has really played a, a very important role in bringing uh, institutions to the forefront of economic uh, theory. You want to say some? some? Thank you, Gerard. Uh, a few other quick comments. The influence he has had, let me give you one dimension we haven't mentioned yet through his graduate students. 
in the PhD program that we have in business and public policy within the business school, and of course, PhD program within the economics department. Profound influence on generations of scholars that came after him. This is an important part of the legacy. As I look out at this group, I'm looking to my right, George Akerlof, another Nobel Prize in economics in the room. Uh, I remember a conversation that I had When I was an undergraduate here and just about to graduate, and he counseled and coached me about going on to graduate school in economics, these people have profound influence on young people. And they change their lives, and they create a richer intellectual environment for all of us. Really important to me, really important, I think, to all of us. One last quick comment from my side is the business school, business school faculty member hasn't won a Nobel Prize since 1994. I've been putting a lot of pressure on my faculty. <laughs> and I'm just delighted that somebody has stepped up and responded the way Oliver has. This award couldn't have gone to a, to a more wonderful person. For those of you that know him, for all of his gifts intellectually, this is one of my favorite people. And I couldn't be happier. Thanks to you very much. So the, the fact that Oliver Williamson uh, got the uh, Nobel Prize today, I think, is, is also a testimony to, to a certain intellectual atmosphere that we have at, at Berkeley. And uh, uh, that, that indeed, you know, uh, 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 also George Akerlof, uh, you know, Dan McFadden, previous uh, recipients of the Nobel Prize, uh, there's something very special about doing research at Berkeley. There's, there's a, uh, an extremely collegial uh, atmosphere. There's a willingness to challenge existing dogmas. There's a, 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 a very pragmatic approach. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and there's there's a great deal of collaboration. And I think uh, these are all great recipes for uh, uh, high quality economics uh, research. Uh, and uh, it's really my pleasure now to uh, introduce the hero of the day, uh, Oliver Williamson. Thank you. Those really moving remarks, and I obviously pleased that uh, I have all this support uh, and uh, and the you know the opinions of uh, colleagues that I truly value. That uh, so it's a little daunting, but um, Berkeley is truly a, a glorious place to have uh, been been these last uh, twenty years and. And uh, great colleagues and good students. And um, uh, at one time, actually, I, I served as chair of the Academic Senate, uh, 1995 to 96. Uh, and in that connection, I was sort of reflecting on the, the merits of, of Berkeley. And, uh, and of course, its its commitment to excellence is so extraordinary. But in addition to being committed to excellence, it's excellence across the length and breadth of the campus. And, and um, uh, there, is, uh, there was a National Research Council report that came out uh, in, uh, I think, it was September of, of 95 uh, that uh, recorded that of 36 fields in which the Berkeley campus was represented, 35 out of 36 were in the top 10. There was no other university uh, length and breadth of the country that had that kind of uh, uniform commitment to excellence. The other thing about Berkeley that I think is extraordinary is the energy that this place you know, communicates. You can't walk around this campus and not get picked up. And you can't sort of uh, talk to colleagues and not sort of share uh, uh, sort of intellectual ideas in a in a freewheeling fashion that's uh, you know, the genuine interests of other people's work as well as your own. So it's been great to be here. I've had uh, wonderful students, as Rich uh, referred to, and I'm proud of the work they've, they've done. And I, and I think that this award will, uh, I hope this reward will redound to uh, you know, their satisfaction and 
I look forward to seeing many of them uh, later today and, and by phone and at conferences and the like. But I, um, yeah, there's other people that have been really central to this enterprise as well. Uh, and my wife, Dolores, that's uh, sitting here in the front row, has been a stalwart. I don't want to go through uh, you know, the, the many changes that uh, uh, movements from one university to another or to take a research appointment here or do that, but uh, she's been there uh, like a rock. And uh, without her, I just don't think uh, all this would have come together. And uh, we have five kids, and the kids have been a joy, and, uh, and also uh, marvelously adaptable and supportive. So I, uh, I'm a lucky guy. Uh, the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the third in the last 10 years, of the fifth since Girard. Uh, Nobel Prize is in economics. Uh, we have some wonderful young people coming along. And uh, they, there's more ahead, is uh, all I can sort of assure you of. And I'm certain that George will agree with uh, that uh, that's in prospect. Um, you know, uh, a little bit about some background in people that were uh, important in, in, my, in my career. And, and these were often just fortuitous. I mean, people didn't have to, but they took an interest in, uh, uh, in, in my career, which kind of was from uh, uh, engineering prog program at MIT as an undergraduate to an MBA at Stanford, uh, a member of the faculty, which steered me into economics, uh, where I had the benefit of uh, meeting and being inspired by uh, Kenneth Arrow, among others, who I only had one course with, but I, at a conference I attended maybe 20 years later, and Ken was going through the list of students that were at this conference. Um, and he named a, a series of them. And then he named me as one of his students. And I was really proud of that because you know, I, was, I didn't even think he remembered me. It, uh, but he, he, he explained why he remembered me. And I, uh, I never really thought of uh, uh, sort of you know, your, your academic career in this fashion. And he says, you used to ask good questions. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was what he had in the back of his mind. But I, I, moved, I left Stanford to go to Pittsburgh. And a lot of people say, sort of question, uh, what's going on here? But uh, they had a program at Carnegie. Uh, Carnegie there was then uh, Carnegie Tech since uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, that was a very interdisciplinary program that I was privileged to be a part of. And uh, I just uh, kind of related immediately to the idea that the social sciences should communicate with one, one another and that uh, there were boundaries that we ought to be prepared to cross if, as, if and as the phenomena uh, itself reached across it. So I had the benefit of people like uh, Herbert Simon and Jim March, and uh, Dick Seyert, and Jack Muth, and Alan Meltzer, and uh, Franco Modigliani. And, uh, and it was just a cast of characters, the likes of which very hard to put together uh, in a small, small program such as this was. But uh, oh, I should add another one, uh, Mert Miller. I mean, these four of the last people I just named got Nobel Prizes in economics. So uh, this, uh, but it was it was uh, it was just exciting uh, research uh, arena, and I started to appreciate that uh, economics and organization, in fact, could share common ground rather than uh, divide it, and uh, that's been sort of uh, my project since. Um, in the in the process, I've uh, had uh, good colleagues that every place I've been in, and uh, never more than more so than here at Berkeley. So it's, um, no, it's, it's just uh, uh, an intellectual adventure. Um, and I sort of talk in terms of uh, adaptive sequential decision making as being the way to kind of uh, make, your way, make your way through the, 
the uh, uh, puzzle of uh, uh, where to go and what to work on, um, that's, uh, that's that's been much of what I've what I've been up to. But the, the, there is there are some common themes, and the common theme that uh, organization matters, and and can be made susceptible to analysis. I guess is sort of the the bottom line, and and is the recurrent issue to which I uh, kind of continuously return. So I don't know if I uh, missed any uh, missed any of this. There, there are there are some stories I could tell, but we'll we'll let that go. <laughs> and, uh, I should I should uh, hear from others out there, I guess. So so we're happy to open it up to questions. So if anyone would like to start. Yeah, hi, uh, Glenn Chapman, National Journal Press. Uh, just just curious, given your research about um, the effect of behavior on markets, and we've just had this great meltdown. What? What what do you what context do you feel your research either should have tuned people into or can tune people into about the behaviors that help contribute to what just happened with the global economy? Well, uh, let me let me sort of try to answer in a two part way. One of which is uh, you know I'm a microeconomist, uh, not a macro guy, and we I have a lot of good colleagues that uh, work the the macro uh, field, and you know, some of them here on campus, some of them currently in Washington, that are better qualified than I to sort of speak to uh, macro uh, economic developments and, and GNP and, and inflation and, and unemployment and the like. That said, I do think that uh, organizations is, is important and, uh, and it's made you know, it's the, the major impact that uh, my kind of work has had is, is relates more to issues like antitrust and regulation. Uh, but I do, in fact, think that uh, an organization is important uh, in a pervasive kind of a way uh, and in ways that uh, uh, haven't been given much attention, haven't been uh, much researched, but I think can be brought to bear and I hope will be brought to bear. And uh, I, uh, there's a conference that's going to be organized uh, next spring that uh, I was recently invited to, and, and which the idea that uh, organization ought to, ought to be applied more systematically to uh, uh, the study of government is, is one with which I agree, and I've done a little bit of work on it, some of my colleagues have. But, but uh, more such work uh, should uh, should be done, and uh, and it, what it does is it forces you to address issues of a more detailed microanalytic kind than uh, than was hitherto uh, the case. So that some of the phenomena that came as a surprise to us, if we had sort of said, well, look, uh, organization is important not merely in the private sector, but also in in the way uh, the treasury is run. Uh, the Fed is run, um, you know, the uh, SEC is run. There's, there's just no question that there are important uh, uh, organizational issues that reside therein, and that uh, with the benefit of a combined economics law, well, law, economics, and organization uh, perspective, uh, uh, I think that um, uh, there's uh, uh, the, the possibility that we could foresee some of the hazards. That is one of the things that this contractual approach uh, t attempts to do is it sort of says, uh, look, if everything goes well, you know, it probably doesn't matter a lot which way you organize. But if things go haywire, that's what you're, that's where the you know, that's where the big problems reside. And these shouldn't come as surprises to us. We ought to anticipate some of these and take uh, advanced action to mitigate uh, the worst downside. And that lesson is robust and applies to government agencies. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one way, this is too ambitious, but nonetheless, I would suggest that organization is sufficiently important that in addition to having a council of economic advisors, that we should think about having a council of organizational advisors and that the interaction between the two of them uh, should be active. But there's, I think that there is some specialization that is, uh, you know, that in which economics is so predominant that they're, they, 
uh, those problems are comfortably located there. There are going to be some others that are uh, so fully organizational in character that, uh, you know, that I think an economic approach to these can be brought to bear without sort of, you know, sort of saying this is, this is in the pur with, fully within the purview of economists. And then, there's, and there, then there are the interactions. And I don't know how easy it'll be to orchestrate that. But I think the issues are too important to uh, treat uh, in a, or to fail to treat in a systematic way. Sir, Tim Ryan, KCBS Radio. Now, along the same lines, very few Americans are going to really understand what you have dedicated your career to doing. And congratulations to you. But, but most Americans, I, I think, feel that our, our current economic situation just comes down to greed, and corruption and an inept Congress. I, I know this is a happy day for you, but do you, I mean, do you have words that, that you can share with Americans on what, what in the world just happened in the last six months to our economy? Is it, is it greed? Well, that there, that there uh, are elements of greed out there I don't, uh, I don't uh, uh, disagree with. But if you, if you start thinking about uh, Organizing economic activity through the lens of contract. Uh, you know the the main uh, benefits that accrue to contract are those of mutual gain. That is, there are you know there are, uh, sellers and buyers and mutual gain is to be realized, uh, and that is so that accrues not merely locally but you know, spreads to the economy more generally. So I think the uh, you know the idea of being respectful of uh, 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 the the benefits, uh, the boundless benefits that have been realized by organizing more intelligently and uh, uh, avoiding uh, excesses of, of uh, intervention and regulation uh, are are uh, you know just. Uh, it's too, it's too easy to sort of be hostile and, and critical. Uh, and if you can you know, put differently, it, it, is, it is easy to sort of criticize uh, what we have with respect to a hypothetical ideal where everything is frictionless and, um, and uh, you know, uh, optimization for the benefit of all rules today. But in practice, we have to sort of describe feasible alternatives. You have to make choices between flawed feasible alternatives. And some of these, you know, if it's the best you can do, uh, let's not uh, climb all over it as though it's you know, because it has imperfections. If in fact you, have, if you, if in fact you can offer uh, improvements, um, and improvements in, you know, if, if have been made and can be made, and I think you know, if, if, if we uh, proceed with this kind of science of organization, if you will, uh, will be made more intelligently in the, in the future than they have been in the past. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what the name of the project is up to. So uh, it's not you know, uh, woe is to us or, or this, uh, this system is, uh, is fundamentally corrupt. Uh, it is, uh, you know, we've come a long way, we've uh, made some mistakes. Some of them we should have had the intelligence to uncover and avoid. Uh, and that's the challenge for the future. George Ashworth, The Daily Cow. Uh, do you think the so-called uh, post-Fortis trend towards uh, smaller, uh, less vertically integrated uh, businesses will cause the analysis of microeconomics to be more important than, or, or at least increase the importance of it, versus economic, uh, macroeconomic analysis for national government uh, policy making? Well, I, 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 I'm not in a position to sort of say that uh, uh, it's become more, more important than, than macro for uh, decision making purposes, but it certainly is the case that uh, that uh, I think that attention to uh, uh, microeconomic phenomena and recognizing that you know, there are system consequences that accrue there too, and that you know, there are more and less intelligent public policy programs that ought to be 
informed thereby uh, that this is, you know, some of this has been accomplished, but we have a long ways to go. And, and I look forward to uh, yeah, deeper, uh, deeper knowledge and understanding. And, and, uh, and the hope would be that uh, uh, this, will, this will influence uh, uh, you know, outcomes. And I think you know, that there's, oh, a lot of these things are, you know, that is one of, the, one of the reasons why it would, you may not think that you know, we would have a council of, of uh, organizational advisors is that uh, you know, politics is, is uh, you know, it's really deep, deeply interested and through that, you know, the, the, the process of influencing politics uh, through various kinds of influence measures uh, is deeply invested in getting organizational outcomes that they favor, uh, that, um, you know, that there, are, there, are, there are going to be difficulties in trying to, in trying to implement this. But if at the same time we can display that uh, you know, this particular proposal is seriously flawed in, the, in this respect as compared with another alternative. Um, you know, and, and that uh, people that are making those choices are, are making choices that are contrary to the public interest. Uh, you know, I, I think that there are, you know, there are benefits that, uh, that they're, they're going to be, they're going to be confronted with dilemmas that they weren't pre previously confronted with because the, the issues hadn't been examined in a comparative organizational way. Well, um, I, I found out by, uh, uh, I was mentioning this to some people earlier, actually. If, if you're, uh, and I actually mentioned this to, a, to a, uh, uh, one of your counterparts in, in the newspaper business earlier today, and that is uh, if you follow the conferences that are organized by the Royal Swedish Academy. Uh, this gives you a hint as to what direction their interests are turning. And there's usually about a year delay after the conference to whether or not they actually follow up on this. Uh, a year ago, September, there was a conference on uh, uh, economics and organization uh, in a combined way that was held in Stockholm. And um, there was a background kind of uh, understanding that this might uh, be a preview to things to come. Um, I've been, I've been sort of, I mean, they have so-called short lists and I've been aware that uh, my name was band-aid about in that connection, but some of the stuff I do is, is kind of controversial and, and not uh, uh, universally uh, you know, accepted as, as the uh, working within the, the accepted framework of, of uh, the economic setup. And so who's to say what, uh, what's going to eventuate? But, uh, that, I suppose, encouraged me to alert my son, who uh, and his wife from Poland are visiting with us, uh, that uh, it's conceivable that there will be a telephone call this morning. Uh, if there is, answer the phone. And, uh, <laughs> uh, the phone be, being in his room rather than our room. Uh, and uh, his name actually is Oliver Jr. So if they asked him, "Are you Oliver Williamson?" Um, uh, he could have said yes. Uh, but uh, the 3:30 call, uh, he presumed had uh, his father in mind, and he came to me and said, uh, "I think this is a qu accurate quote. I think this is the call." <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and so I went and answered the call at 3.30 uh, to be told that uh, it was originating in Stockholm at, uh, under the auspices of the Nobel Foundation. And, um, and I uh, had the 
uh, high honor and privilege of being named a Nobel laureate, uh, uh, along with Professor Ostrom at uh, uh, Indiana University. Are there any uh, uh, questions from the conference line? Yep. Okay. Hello? Hello. Oh, yes, sir. Question? Yeah. Um, um, uh, Rich Miller at Bloomberg. Um, I was wondering what, what uh, uh, his, his work would. Uh, am, I, am I live or? I... Live. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Professor, I was wondering what, what your work might, might say. Uh, um, uh, about the regulation in in in, in the uh, the wake of the of the crisis, uh, you know, there have been some uh, proposals to uh, uh, maybe break up financial firms or limit uh, limit their uh, uh, scope uh, so that we don't have this too big to fail uh, problem. Uh, what would your sort of uh, uh, research suggest would be the best way forward uh, in that area? Well, I think that's a that's an important question, and uh, we haven't been really confronted with it before. One of the things that I, I think of it as a as a benefit, but it is also a cost of doing uh, transaction cost economics or the economics of governance, uh, is that you need to have a, a lot of deep knowledge about the phenomenon in question in order to make uh, informed kinds of of answers. Uh, I think that these kinds of questions could and should uh, come under examination, but I don't think there, are, there, is, there is no silver bullet, there is no instant answer uh, that I or any of my students uh, or most of my colleagues would be prepared to advance on that. But I, but I think the challenge is very real and it's more apparent now than it was before by, and, and reinforces the idea that that uh, the study of organization ought to be folded into the study of public policy in a more systematic fashion. Any other questions? Yeah, hi. Um, sorry, I'm, um, the, clear isn't com the call isn't coming in very clearly, so I'm not sure if this was addressed already. But, Professor, how much do you think the, that the financial crisis was on the mind of the Nobel Economics Committee uh, in awarding your prize at uh, very little, uh, but I but I think that that's not to say that they're they're not sort of uh, you know interested in in the issues, uh, but in this particular case, I don't think that that figured very prominently on their decision. Other questions. Yes, um, professor, professor, this is Matt Krupnik with the Bay Area News Group. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I mean, what, what does this say about um, Berkeley, considering the, you know, I mean, with all the budget cuts and all the talk about um, the decline in quality possibly coming over the next few years? I mean, what, what are your thoughts on what this means for Berkeley? Thank you, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, Berkeley is an incredibly resilient university. It, uh, you know, it uh, has had lots of uh, challenges that it has had to face and deal with uh, in the last 50 years. And I think that uh, you know, the, the current crisis is maybe unprecedented, probably unprecedented in its severity, but I, I just cannot imagine that uh, with all the resources on campus and the goodwill on campus, and uh, the foresight that one would hope that uh, exists in Sacramento, that uh, they won't recognize that this is a, a resource if uh, once squandered uh, you know, could never be kind of reassembled. And therefore, uh, there's, a, there's a duty, not only on our part to hang together through this, but the, for the state government uh, to step up and, and finance the university through uh, uh, these times of trouble. Yeah, 
Any further questions? Uh, Professor, what do you plan to do with the prize money? I haven't. Uh, I, I haven't digested uh, the prize money in, uh, in terms of uh, its allocation. But believe me, there are some worthy purposes I have in mind, and uh, I intend to deflect a significant amount of it in their way. I think you get to travel a lot if you like to travel. <laughs> In my particular case, I have a, a very resistant biological clock, and so it, uh, there's some bad, real trade-offs that are posed. But, but um, no, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, you're, you're sort of in the limelight for a day, and then you're, and you're back to work or soon thereafter. That's what I'm told, too, and I'm uh, looking forward to it. But uh, <laughs> the chancellor is uh, under the gun to make the good delivery. <laughs>